All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, some people will probably be joining uh, in a couple minutes. That's fine. Uh, but basically, uh, welcome to this talk. Uh, my name is Chris Hennigan. I'm a software engineering manager at 2U, previously Trove. Um, a little bit about my background, a little untraditional. Uh, started at the University of South Carolina studying computer science. Uh, did not graduate. So went for three years, um, ended up getting an entry level web development job um, right out of school, uh, moved, started. That's really what started my journey in engineering. Um, I spent the next seven to eight years um, working in all different kinds of industries, um, you know, fintech, consulting, um, big corporations, startups, crypto. Um, Esports, uh, working for companies like Fannie Mae, um, Boardwalk Pipelines, any anything you can really imagine, I've kind of been there. Aside from defense contracting, I haven't done that. Um, but I got to see a lot of different industries and company sizes, uh, and I worked my way up from entry level um, engineer into senior, and then eventually into lead engineer, and then making the transition into software engineering manager. Um, and so. I feel like I have a lot of good insights from both sides. That's kind of what this talk is um, centered around, engineering mentorship, why and how for both sides. So that's a little bit of background and let's get into it. So I give you a little bit of a background about me, but um, let me give you a little bit about what motivates me. So there's always a decision in an engineer's career where they have to make a decision of what track they want to go on. Um, and previously there were only really two tracks. It was, you know, you stay in IC or you become a manager and, you know, those were really the only two options. But nowadays there are a lot more options available uh, within engineering, whether that's principal engineering track, whether that is architecture, um, whether that's management. Uh, so there's, there's a lot more different options and it used to be that you couldn't really, um, stay as an IC engineer doing what you really loved. Um, but that's not the case anymore. And so one of the decisions I had to make, um, in my career was which direction do I want to go? Um, I was leaning towards architecture, uh, leaning back towards principal, um, and eventually landed on the manager track. And the reason for that is when I made the transition into, you know, being a lead engineer, I was already doing a lot of the things um, that I do now in my day to day. I was doing a lot of the code reviews. I was, you know, mentoring junior engineers. I was um, helping with architecture. Um, and one of the things that I like to say is even in my personal life, I've always been involved in some sort of coaching, learning opportunities, whether that is, you know, teaching Taekwondo for 15 years or um, coaching my two year old's soccer team. I've always been involved in some sort of learning and education and coaching. Uh, so I'm really passionate about that. When I first made the transition into software engineering management, I wasn't sure if I was going to like it. I wasn't sure my my biggest my biggest fear was i would be missing out on you know being able to scratch that technical itch being able to get in the code but what i found was for me personally um i sort of got the best of all worlds i got to you know experience coaching i got to still be involved in architectural discussions which i love um still have, get to run the apps locally and still dig in on that level um, and while I'm not necessarily um, a point for point contributor sprint to sprint, um, I like I take solace in the fact of knowing that, you know, I've got the apps running. I could contribute um, if needed. And so that's sort of the position I'm coming from now, uh, just to give you a little bit of context. So let's get in. How about that coaching and mentoring? and those TPS reports. Uh, we're gonna talk about the first big topic, responsibility. So 
the one thing I've seen in a lot of different organizations is um, not being active in your own career. And what I mean by that is when you're first starting out, it's hard. If it's your first job out of college, if it is, you know, your first uh, job out of a boot camp, or if it's your 15th year in the industry, I've seen a lot of people go on autopilot and I've seen a lot of people, you know, coasting and basically just trying to stave off burnout from themselves. Uh, so some strategies that we can do, um, seeking mentorship, uh, communication, professional development, and, you know, expanding your network. So let's talk about why is it important to take responsibility, first of all, in your career? Well, it's never a good plan to put the future of your career in the hands of other people. And what that means is you should be the driving force behind your career. Um, you shouldn't leave it up to chance. You shouldn't leave it up to, you know, well, maybe an opportunity will open up. Uh, you really have to be the driving force in your career. And so that's sort of where a mentor comes in. You should actively be looking to seek and provide mentorship. And it's important to have both because they give you different things and you get different things from each role. So seeking out a mentor, what are you looking for? Well, you need to figure out where do you want to be in you know, the next year? Where do you want to be in the next three years? Where do you want to be in the next five years? Once you start thinking about that, you need to find a mentor that will provide you advice and guidance for how to do that. And one of the easiest ways to find a mentor is to find someone in the position you want to be in in five years or three years or whatever your goal is. So how do you do that? You can uh, use your network. We're going to talk about that later. Look on LinkedIn. Look within the organization that you currently work in. Is there anybody that you admire? Is there anybody that, you know, is just constantly getting stuff done that you want to model your work after. Um, these are all different ways that you can go and find a mentor. And so the other side of this is provide mentorship. And a lot of people will say, well, I'm so new that I can't really offer anything to another person. But that's not true. You always have something to offer. And one of the things that you can work on is if you're newer, set goals to become the owner of something small, whether that is a small library, a small subset of the library, become proficient to um, become proficient in one small area um, that you can become, you know, a point of contact, that you can become a subject matter expert eventually. And that starts building the mindset of, you know, instilling leadership qualities and also enforcing your own knowledge, because if you teach something, it's going to enforce your own knowledge um, and affect the person that you're giving that knowledge to. So that is seeking and providing mentor mentorship. Um, one quick thing for the chat. Um, if you have questions in Q&A, um, there is a separate Q&A tab. So if you could put those in the Q&A, uh, we'll, we, we'll have a section at the end um, and I'll try and go through all of the questions. All right. Um, effective communication uh, with your manager and leaders. Let's go over this one. So it's very important that you become an effective communicator because um, there are so many scenarios and so many uh, things that happen within an organization that rely on communication. And it's hard to get things done if you cannot effectively communicate. Um, so some of the things that we'll be discussing within this, we'll go through in another slide, um, but this is gonna involve things like one-on-ones and um, how to communicate within your org. And then we're gonna go through professional development, um, how to audit that, and then expanding your network. Um, so. 
let's go back to mentorship. So what can having a mentor do for you? We kind of got into that. And uh, what can you offer as a mentor? We touched on the subject matter expert and uh, trying to find your niche within an organization. Uh, those are those are just some ideas for the people that are just starting out. If you are a more tenured engineer or you are someone who has hit a senior level, uh, staff level, principal level, um, you can really offer a lot of guidance as a mentor. Um, and like I said before, becoming that senior level presence and instilling knowledge in uh, more junior engineers is only going to both bolster, you know, your skills and your knowledge. Um, and so the whole point of the two prong seek mentorship and seek a mentee is you get a lot out of each side and it's not restricted to, well, you can only be a mentor if you're super senior. Uh, that's just not true. And so that goes to the mindset. Um, and then finding the mentor and mentee, like I said, you can use your LinkedIn network. Um, you can look within your organization. You can look, um, you know, really, if you have someone from, you know, maybe it's a professor, maybe it's uh, one of your previous managers outside your organization. Um, and just know that you're not limited to just having a single mentor. It's, it's good and healthy practice to have multiple mentors. Um, and they can be your mentor for multiple different reasons. So... All right, let's talk about communication. So one second, quick technical difficulty. All right, can everybody still hear me? Thumbs up. All right, awesome. Awesome. Okay, so one-on-ones. So the the culture of one-on-ones uh, should not just be an extended stand-up. They should have aspects. They can have aspects of you know the day-to-day -day work, but they really should be um, centered around um, the individual contributors or the person coming to the manager for it's really their meeting and so it's important as a manager to tailor that to their style um everybody has a different style that they like to be managed and everybody kind of has a management style so it's important to figure out and build that relationship and build it out under the um, auspices of people are going to want feedback differently people are going to want you know some people like a little bit more involvement when they're being managed. Some people don't like as much involvement. Some people want to meet weekly. Some people don't want to meet weekly. So it's important that you establish and use your communication with your manager to set expectations. And on the other side, it's useful for the manager to do the same. It's a give and take. And it's, it's really figuring out the best way to work together. And so let's go into some of the one-on-one -on -one topics. Um, so it's when you're having a one-on-one, -on -one, uh, the things that you bring into that meeting, um, you should be asking questions that will get to the answers that you're looking for. If you are asking a lot of questions that are yes or no, those aren't really helpful and they're kind of like dead end questions. So asking less, less questions like, did you have a good sprint or, you know, how did we it, asking less questions that end in yes or no and more questions like, how do you feel like we could have solved this blocker better? Um, or, you know, if you're asking your manager about something that happened within the organization, um, what sort, of, what sort of going on within the organization that caused this and what can we expect? Asking questions that are open-ended and allow the other person to elaborate and dig in are much more effective than just yes or no questions. So other questions that you could ask um, as an individual contributor, um, as an engineer, it's important that you 
you'll basically get out what you put in in a one-on-one. -on -one. So if you if you kind of you know it's it, it goes back to being active. If you have feedback that you are regularly bringing, if you have topics in your one-on-one -on -one docs um, prepared ahead of time, that's going to help your you and your manager in the long run because you're going to have things that are that you can talk about. You're going to be bringing topics. Those are going to spawn um, other conversations that may be unrelated just, just by the nature of having those conversations. And so it's really good to be prepared and be intentional with your one-on-ones. Um, if you need to postpone, a lot of people will say that you should never you know, reschedule one-on-ones or you should never postpone one-on-ones. Um, I think that it's important to have them, but I'm much more I'm much more on the team of if you're effectively communicating with your manager uh, and your manager is effectively communicating with you, um, it shouldn't really matter. Like it shouldn't be a big deal to reschedule. Um, and it shouldn't be a big deal if you want to postpone. Uh, that's just my take on it. Like it, it also goes back to agile is not one size fits all. Um, and there is no one agile. It's how do we, how do we develop a relationship that, um, allows us to work in the best way possible together. Uh, and that's really a lot of what developing these communications are. All right, skip levels. Um, some organizations do this and some don't. Uh, I personally like doing skip levels just because it offers some opportunities that may not necessarily uh, be there otherwise. It gives you a few things. It gives you access to a different level that you're in within an organization. And I understand some organizations are flat, but it still gives you access to a level that you might not have um, a lot of visibility into. So this could be, um, if you're skip leveling to a director position, you're seeing, you're having conversations that are much more high level, much more um, things that would happen um, and not get to you maybe in one hop. So things like you may, it's just a different perspective. You engage an org organization. If things are not, um, it also gives you an open communication channel um, in case you are having like some real problems uh, within the organization um, that necessarily you wouldn't go to HR about, but you're having issues within the organization. It gives you another communication line. Um, and so I think it's really important to also, you know, be visible within the organization, um, not just because, you know, you're under your manager, directors don't have a lot of visibility sometimes into um, the team levels as far as individual contributors. It's good to be visible. It's good to, you know, represent your work and represent your team um, and take advantage of those opportunities. So being present within the organization is really good as well. And I understand that a lot of, a lot of people just like, you know, don't feel comfortable uh, putting themselves out there. But as long as you can, you know, work on shifting the mindset of becoming more responsible and active within your own career, um, you'll work toward these things and they'll become easier over time. And um, for career development. So we've touched on the one-on-ones and the skip levels. Um, and in the nature of the one-on-ones that I like to do over time, uh, we do a lot of career development. And what I like to do for the career development are skill gap analyses, engineering development plans, and personal, personal professional accomplishment tracking. So kind of a three-pronged solution. And if your organization has the frameworks in place to... Uh, do career development. And so, for example, your organization may have um, a development ladder and you can use that in the skill gap analysis to measure what you need to work on. But if your organization doesn't have any of that, that's when you have to sort of take things into your own hands. And one thing that's really powerful is the skill gap analysis and what you can do. And I have an example of this um, can everybody see the document? 
I've got thumbs. All right. So this is a template that I created. Um, I'm not going to read it to you word for word, but basically this breaks down into an area, a current skill level, a desired skill level, and your self analysis of identifying what you think the gaps are. And so this is just an example of maybe you want to evaluate your databasing and your React skills. What you would do is you would rate your current skill level, what you think you are. Um, then you want to rate where you want to be or where you think you should be. And then the last part is where do you think the gaps are and what do you think, you know, what do you think, what do you think is missing from your tool belt to be able to be, you know, not a three, but a four? Um, that's the first part of the exercise. The second part of the exercise is actually taking this skill gap analysis and going over it with your manager and saying, hey, you know, I've done this analysis. Um, I've went over my skill set. Here's where I feel like my gaps are. Um, do you have any insight? And your manager will be able to go through that with you and you know, maybe has a couple of tweaks, um, but collaboratively with you, um, collaboratively with you, be able to go through this. Um, and that leads into the engineering development plan. And so this is just a very crude template uh, example. Um, the way that I like to introduce an engineering development plan is um oh, question in the chat yeah i'll share links to all these resources they'll they'll be on the last slide um okay so basically how i introduced the engineering development plan is this is identifying proficiencies that you want to um get better at and you can pull these off of your skill gap analysis you can also um, pull in things that wouldn't be on the skill gap analysis. Maybe it's something where you want to get better at public speaking, any proficiency that you want to get to. And it's not limited to one. This document could look like three or four, maybe even five of these proficiencies. I break it down further into uh, resources, implementation opportunities, and experience. And so the resources column, um, this is identifying, is it a Udemy course? Is it uh, cloud training? Is it um, identifying subject matter experts within your organization that you want a one-on-one -on -one with or set up a few sessions with for knowledge sharing sessions? That's the resources. Implementation opportunities is important because it's tough to build proficiency if you can't, um, if you can't experience an implementation opportunity. Like, yes, you can read it and do tutorials, but unless you, you know, have the hands-on experience, it's tough to actually solidify that experience. And so what this means is looking for opportunities within your everyday work. Um, if, if we're talking about, you know, uh, public speaking, this could be running a meeting. This could be presenting to a team. If we're talking about, you know, learning uh, portions of a framework that you have at work that you're not familiar with getting tickets and telling your manager you have interest in learning these ideas and working with them to find opportunities to be able to dig into that, to advance yourself. So that's, that's implementation opportunities. And the third part, which I think is important for any level is the experience. So this is sharing your experience and sharing the knowledge. One, it builds more leadership traits and it helps with a lot of different things, a lot of soft skills. Um, you know, you'll hear buzzwords or the buzzword sentence of, you know, communicating technical requirements to non-technical stakeholders, all these things that it helps do. Um, also, it helps, you know, spark that spark in somebody else. Everybody knows somebody or everybody's been in a position where they're like, you know, I sh I've been trying to get this cert for four years, but... You know, it's always been on the back burner. Somebody giving a presentation on them completing it and, you know, how they feel about it and how they, do, how they did it. Um, that's going to spark interest in a lot of different people and be like, you know, maybe I will get that certification. So it's important in a lot of different ways to do that. 
And then there's an optional last part for um, identifying a time frame. To me, if we're if we're effectively communicating with our manager and the manager is effectively communicating with us, time frame is kind of optional. Like you can set it, but you don't have to, because you're always going to be coming back every so often and reviewing this. And as long as um, the two of you feel like you're making progress on it, um, it's up to you whether you include it or not. All right. So this last one, I don't have a template for, um, but it doesn't have to be fancy. This is the idea that you should be, you should be maintaining, in my opinion, you should be maintaining a personal or professional accomplishment tracker. And what this means is, you know, it sounds, it sounds like, well, I've got this stuff on my resume, but you don't put everything on your resume, right? This is, this is a little bit more granular than just the stuff that you put on your resume. It could be, you know, you successfully, um, you know, any number of things. You successfully uh, did the research and got something approved. You know, you wouldn't necessarily put that in your resume. You would put things like, you know, you got a, you carried a project over the finish line. But the reason that this is important is it allows you to audit yourself and it allows you to cross-reference your expectations for what you've done against what's happening within the org. You know, let's say that um, your organization doesn't really have a framework for uh, career tracking. This is a good way for you to present yourself and be your own advocate and not leaving it up to, well, I think I think so-and-so is doing a good job. Uh, they've worked really hard. This is taking that out of somebody's hands and saying, wow, we've got all these different accomplishments that this person has done. Um, you know, they deserve this promotion, right? And so it's all about having that. And if you have your personal professional accomplishment tracker, you can cross-reference that with what's being shared in the org, um, how the promotions are. And if they don't align, that allows you to have uh, deeper conversations that allows you to start having these conversations of these things are not in alignment and something has to change. Um, and it's important to be able to get to that point, to have that conversation and it can be tough to get there and it can be, it can be daunting to sort of approach something because uh, it feels weird and it feels like, you know, stressful. And so this kind of takes that to the next level, gives you the backup, gives you your own, you know, satisfaction of, you know, here's all the stuff that I've done. And if you, this kind of goes hand in hand with your skill gap analysis too, because you can have accomplishments on there and you can be like, wow, I really struggled with um, this on this project. Um, maybe I should, you know, jot this down and think about this later. Maybe I can, you know, add this to my next skill gap analysis and really work on this. So it's important to have these tools in your tool belt. Networking. I am definitely one of the people that does not enjoy networking. It stinks, but I do it. <laughs> and you should too. I know a lot of people that hate networking. Um, but, you know, why is it important? Well, it's important for a number of different reasons. One, because, you know, opportunity is always out there. If you have a strong network and you know, you maintain relationships, then you have um, a larger group to pull from if, you know, you need something or somebody needs something from you and you're able to provide it. And that's not just if you need a job, it's, you know, maybe somebody is having a difficult time uh, learning something and you've been there, you're able to provide um, mentorship. So opportunities, not just in the form of uh, a job opportunity, opportunities to find mentorship, to find a mentee, to uh, provide um, coaching for somebody even. Uh, you may know somebody that, you know, has a niece that's just getting into the market and needs guidance. These are all ways to build connections and build opportunities. Um, 
So another one, sorry, getting questions in Q&A. We'll go over them, I promise. Um, so that's what a healthy network can do for you. Not only job opportunities, but finding mentorship opportunities, a mentee, finding coaching opportunities, and then what you can provide to your network, uh, just the same. And that is sort of wrapping up my high level talk. Um, so I really appreciate everybody for sitting through this. Um, just to go back over high level, you have to take responsibility for your career. Um, nobody is going to do it for you. And if somebody does, you got very lucky and it's the exception, not the norm. Um, seek out mentorship opportunities in both directions. Level up your communication, build great career plans. It's very important to do that. Um, and then we just talked about, you know, expand your network. Um, it's not just job opportunities and it's not just recruiters. I promise there are opportunities to find other things outside of just a job with your network. Here are the links and uh, I've got a link to the skill gap, to the template. Uh, I've got some contact opportunities. Um, I will also put these in the chat. All right, all of the links should now be in the chat. I'm gonna move over to some of the QA. Okay, is it better to ask someone on your team for mentorship or should you reach out to someone outside of work? It depends on what your goal is that you're trying to accomplish. Um, there isn't anything wrong with either of those. Um, one thing that I'll say is try to, like I said, match, match the mentor that you're trying to find with where you want to be or what qualities you want to have uh, when you get to that point. So it, it's less important about where you look for that mentor and more important of the qualities that you want to emulate in that mentor. I hope that answers your question. Uh, Karun, what do you do when you have a manager that is not able to help you grow? They have walked the path of going from staff to manager, uh, presuming they could point out opportunities uh, or guide you to work on this instead of this. Um, this would really help our growth. Instead, he keeps telling me to come up with novel ideas. If changes come from your end, then they are more visible. They want to drive, they want you to drive it, implement a POC. Okay, so Karun, I would say that this is a good opportunity to uh, set expectations with your manager. I know that it can be challenging in some organizations for sure, but I think that if you're having some of these issues, I think that a good exercise will be to identify, if your manager is not gonna identify the learning opportunities and the things that you need um, in order to progress, then I think it's important to uh, figure that out. Um, you can do that either on your own, or like I said, you can find a mentor inside or outside of work. Um, if you're doing it on your own, compile a list of what you need and communicate that to your manager, however awkward it'll be. Um, once it's out there, then you can start working towards that. And it can be awkward, um, but it's important to have the dialogue so that they know, because they may not know. They, don't, they may not know they're doing anything wrong, right? They might just not know. And so... It's important to have the conversation with them. 
And once you do, then it's time to work up to, you know, the, developing these POCs aren't really helping me. You know, maybe it's, I need more leadership opportunities. I need, you know, I need to be able to lead a project. How do I get there? Having those conversations, because um, it sounds like, some of these, some of the conversations may just be surface level. I, I would encourage to avoid surface level conversations because they don't really result in anything. And what I mean by that is if you're able to dig in uh, a layer, two layers, three layers deep, that's where you get a lot of the um, meaningful conversations of actually uh, building a plan and getting into, well, how do you do that? Then you're going another level deeper. Well, maybe we have to do X, Y, and Z. Well, how do we do those? Then you're getting deeper and deeper and you're actually having meaningful discussions rather than, you know, oh, well, the weather's nice, right? Uh, go work on this POC, that kind of thing, right? You want to avoid those. Um, so even, even if it might be awkward and you might be a little bit uncomfortable doing, um, bringing these, things to your manager, I would say that it's worth it. And if you want to sort of solidify that feedback loop, the conversation you can have before that will be uh, set expectations on how they like to receive feedback. It's important to do that too. Um, figure out how they like to receive feedback um, and then deliver that feedback. Mm -hmm. I hope you answered your first question. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Uh, how do you build relationships over Zoom or work from home? My career took a downturn since I started working from home. Our company is still fully remote. It's difficult to learn from others over Zoom. Okay. So this one can be a little tricky. Um, so this is a little bit more going back to the bolstering the communication and leveling up that skill. And what I mean by that is a lot of times the root of how to build a relationship is, you know, finding some sort of commonality, um, you know, sometimes making small talk, figuring out um, people's hobbies, uh, you know, just having uh, normal conversations with them. And it's not something that happens overnight, right? Which, you know, is limited by the fact that there's no water cooler and lunch uh, cafeteria and stuff anymore. But it's one thing you can do is set up, you know, coffee chats. Um, you can set up, you know, uh, one of the ideas I'm thinking about right now uh, is, you know, having some sort of standing room and what I mean by that is uh, having a room where people can just come and go, like maybe before stand up to hang out, to drop in and drop out, that kind of thing. All of those opportunities to sort of meet with coworkers outside of the normal, you know, stand up and planning and grooming um, will help build those relationships. Interacting over Slack. Um, contrary to popular belief, still does do something for building relationships. It's still an interaction. Um, and so as far as learning over Zoom, learning, I think, I think it's not as impacted as some people might feel like, because if you think back to when you were in the office, you know, maybe you could pair a program, maybe you could, um, you know, join a conference room, but at the end of the day, it's, it's still going to boil down a lot to you reading documentation and you writing code. Right. So I think that it might be a little bit impacted, but, um, in, in other ways, I think there are pros also because, you know, they're not, they're not right over your shoulder, like behind your chair. They're just, they're just in the conference room with you, like in zoom. So I think there's pros and cons, but I don't think it's as affected uh, by being virtual. Um, but for sure, there are a couple of differences. I uh, hope that answered your second question. Yeah. Thanks, Chris. Yep. Okay. Paul wants to know any tips on finding a mentor to become a better mentor? That's an interesting question. Um, that is Jedi level 
uh, <laughs> questioning there. Um, I would say that if you want to become a better mentor, there are two things you can do, right? You can get some experience being a mentor, right? Uh, learning by doing. But also, if you are trying to become a better mentor, do you have a mentor already? Are they a good mentor? Why are they a good mentor? Have the conversations with them on how you can be a better mentor, right? So it's not just, you know, they're your mentor in like, you know, maybe they're a React guru and you just want like all the React knowledge from them. If they're a good mentor, they have the qualities that it takes to be a good mentor. So pick their brain and try and identify those qualities that they have um, and try and emulate that. And then finally, be a mentor, learn by doing. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, Paul. All right, Ryan, how do you recommend managing up your mentor? When they start to get distracted from your development, and put you on the back burner. Can you, could you restate that? I guess the part I'm kind of confused on, Ryan, is um, managing up your mentor. I guess if you could clarify that, that'd be helpful. Okay, well, while Ryan is doing that, hopefully, uh, does anybody else have any other questions? Uh, at this point, feel free to voice chat if you want, if you have a question. Chris, I, I think that point that you made about open-ended questions is was really good. Um, I think there's a there's a way to ask open questions, uh, open-ended questions, um, instead of yes and no ones that lead to deeper conversations, right? So, mm -hmm. I think um, I, I believe there's like a technique or something, like you know, instead of uh, you know what, how does how does this work? So that that leads on to another question. Um, exactly right. Yeah, and I think that a lot of a lot of times, a lot of meetings are um, dragged on, or they take a they take a while to get going because I feel like people don't get into those deeper discussions that the meeting is actually there for. There's a lot of like, you know, surface level questions that don't really lead to much. So it's very important to you know ask questions of that nature in a lot of your meetings, just because it helps get to the root of a lot of different things and spawn. Uh, different conversations. So you're you're absolutely right, Karun. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I have not heard back from Ryan, so I will do my best to interpret what I think that. Sorry, can everybody see and hear me? <laughs> I hit the back button on my mouse by accident. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so to kind of get into Ryan's question, you know, if if you're getting put on the back burner, okay, so this would be like communication of following up with your mentor, like or your mentee. Either way, um, if you're not if you're not getting what you need out of, you know, the relationship that can be 
um, frustrating. So just have a conversation, you know, about it, set expectations. I think that a lot of, a lot of the initial conversations around being a mentor and getting a mentee, a lot of the expectations that should be set um, early on are centered around, you know, what they feel like the time commitment they can offer is. And then also being realistic, um, you know, things come up, people get busy. Uh, but as long as you have, you know, open lines of communication and um, have a good relationship with them, you know, you should be able to deliver the feedback. You should be able to, you know, see if they're, maybe they can meet an extra time one week or something like that. Um, but I think setting expectations is a really good habit for that. And also being realistic if things come up. Um, now, if it becomes like a pattern of things where they, they can't meet consistently for like a month or more, um, then it could be time to, you know, just have a conversation and maybe, maybe the um, commitment is too much for them right now. And maybe they, you know, aren't able to do it. Um, that also happens. So just be realistic and, you know, have conversations, communicate, and that'll alleviate a lot of you know, tension, confusion, and frustration. So, yeah, that was the last question. Um, I hope that everybody enjoyed the talk. Um, feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I think that there will also be a spot for comments and stuff um, on this event page after the event ends. Uh, so feel free to reach out on LinkedIn, visit that event page, if I see questions after the fact on the event page, I'll go back and try and answer those. Um, but thanks everybody. I think we'll end it here. Hey, thanks Chris. Thanks all.